Welcome, Daniel Mays from Frith Farm. I'll let you introduce yourself and your farm and take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bo. Um, so yeah, here's, here's my intro slide. Um, I'm Daniel Mays, pronouns he, him, his. I'm the owner of Frith Farm here in Scarborough, Maine, southern Maine, just south of Portland. Um, excited to virtually talk to you all about uh, soil health and intensive uh, vegetable production. Um, so yeah, I'll just go through these slides. I, I have a, a good number of slides, but I think they'll move pretty quickly. I included a lot of photos since uh, I think, you know, we're trying to emulate the farm tour experience here. Um, and hopefully you all had a chance to check out the, the video that Mafka put up. I'm sorry, the audio on it was a little rough, but uh, hopefully you had a chance to check that out. Um, if not, this is, this, you know, certainly can stand alone as well. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna try to move through this at a steady pace. So asking that you type in your questions to Bo, um, he can tabulate them and then I'll try to answer those at the end. Um, if there's a real important question that needs to be asked during it, maybe Bo can do that, but otherwise we'll try to save those till the end in the interest of uh, keeping the, the pace steady um, and getting through all the, the slides. Um, but yeah, then there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. So um, yeah, so here we go. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, this is the, the land I purchased. Um, it was an open hay field and a condemnable old farmhouse um, and it uh, I was able to to buy it with help because uh, it has an easement on it through Maine Farmland Trust and the Scarborough Land Trust um, and for the for so that brought the price almost in half of what it would have been um, and then I got a loan uh, family loan with a you know interest rate of four percent and um, have for the to be able to buy it and have a little bit of money to you know start the farm um so that was yeah that was 10 years ago 2010 fall of 2010 and um it i had very little experience at the time but it's sort of trial by fire and hit the ground running i had uh what i lacked in experience i i had i made up for an energy um in my mid-20s just eager to eager to make it work um so this is uh the farm now thanks to a, a nice drone image from one of our CSA members. Um, and uh, just a little bit of stats about the farm so you know kind of my perspective um, in talking about soil health and, and vegetable production. Uh, we grow on two and a half acres. Um, we don't use tillage um, on that land except to open it initially to convert it from pasture to vegetable land. We till once and then that's it. Um, we have nine or so seasonal employees, so April through uh, November. Um, this year we have 190 CSA families pick up the farm weekly. Um, we also sell at uh, our local farmer's market in Scarborough and four local natural food stores. So those are our markets. Um, annual revenue is a little over 300,000. Um, which you can see from that we're growing really intensively on this land, um, producing a lot um, on, yeah, sort of per square foot. Um, I said four months off in quotes. Um, we're, we're not farming for four months, but there's a lot of planning and ordering and stuff that happens. But, but yeah, we don't go intensively through the winter. Um, we don't do a whole lot of winter growing, mainly just because I uh, feel I can work harder in the growing season if I take a little bit of a break in the winter. Um, so yeah, started in, in late 2010 um, with a $180,000 loan um, at 4% interest. Um, and, and yeah, now we're, we're, you know, we're economically sustainable um, and kind of, yeah, I never would have guessed that the farm would be where it is today when I started out. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I didn't have any off farm income um, from the beginning. I really sort of was working working two full-time jobs, but both on the farm, um, sort of, uh, you know, from the beginning. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, Frith Farm at a glance. Um, and yeah, so talking more about uh, soil health, um, I think uh, I really believe in 
the, the only proven model for a healthy planet is um, the, the natural model, if you will, the model that's worked for hundreds of millions of years, um, you know, with increasing soil health, um, increasing diversity, increasing the photosynthetic productivity of the, of the planet. So that's, that's the, the nature's model is sort of the, the only proven one we have for, for talking about soil health, in my opinion. Um, so, so yeah, what can, we, what can we glean from nature's model that's all around us in any kind of wild space um, that humans haven't managed to intensively? Um, so I, I, I come away with about four, sort of four principles, four key principles um, of soil care. And this is what, this is how nature cares for soil um, if, we, if we let her. Um, so one is photosynthesis is always maximized. There's always just prolific green growing on the soil if, if it's in a healthy state. Um, number two is uh, diversity is abundant and increasing. Um, he's um, inhabiting you know, a, a healthy piece of soil, uh, both in the soil and on the soil. Um, there's just a ton of diversity. Um, three is that soil is, is always covered. Um, you really don't see soil except after a natural disaster. Um, and uh, I would include in that, uh, you know, human made natural disasters, you know, anytime we bulldoze um, the land, that's when you see the soil. Um, but otherwise you really only see it after, a, you know, a hurricane or a landslide or something. That's the only time you'd see exposed soil. Otherwise it's covered either in, in you know, diversity of living plants or at the very least in a sort of layer of duff, that O horizon on top of the soil like you see in the, in the forest floor. Um, and then the fourth principle is um, there's just, uh, there's pretty minimal disturbances. There, there certainly are disturbances, you know, like windstorms come through, you know, animals come through and disturb it, but they're, they're pretty minimal. So as farmers, we can try to minimize our disturbance of, of the land. Um, and that's where, you know, tilling the soil, putting fast moving metal through the soil is, is a pretty intense um, disturbance. That's, you know, you don't really see that in a natural occurrence outside of, you know, like a earthquake, tornado, landslide all in one. Like that's what tilling the soil is kind of mimicking. Um, so yeah, the, with these four natural principles of, of soil health, we can kind of, uh, they can kind of help guide our, our practices. Um, and yeah, try to let them guide our practices here on the farm. Uh, so yeah, just talking a little bit more, why is photosynthesis so important? Um, this is from, uh, from you know, high school chemistry or biology. Uh, photosynthesis takes sunlight and carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turns it into oxygen and food. That's like a, a pretty amazing process. Um, you know, you talk about climate change and if only we could invent some sort of mechanism to suck CO2 out of the air and stick it into the ground somewhere, sequester it away. Well, it turns out that that machine was built, uh, you know, a few hundred million years ago. It's called a plant. Um, so, so yeah, maximizing that is just good for, good for us on so many levels. And it's, it's really the only way to create soil. Um, I'd also argue it's the only uh, renewable source of energy. Um, I know people like solar panels and wind power and all that, but truly renewable uh, source of energy, I think photosynthesis is the only, the only source. Um, so, so yeah, let's talk about how it actually creates soil. Um, there's uh, what gets called the liquid carbon pathway. Um, Dr. Christine Jones, I think, coined that term. She has great YouTube videos online if you want to check them out. But, but uh, basically plants, um, you know, takes the sun's energy and CO2 out of the air with water, with water from the roots and, and they turn that into food in the form of, uh, you know, liquid carbohydrates, sugars, uh, proteins, starches, and they exude a lot of that out their roots, as much as 40% um, out of their roots, um, which you could say, well, why would they do that? Don't the plants want to store that up and you know, increase their own growth? But they do that as, a, as part of an underground economy barter system with all the microbes in the soil. 
and they're feeding those exudates to those microbes. And in exchange, those microbes digest them and, and exude their own metabolites that the plant takes up. And that's how the plant gets nutrients. And, um, and that, that mechanism is what you know, allows plants to thrive, what allows soil life to thrive. And it's what actually creates um, soil as we know it, um, because those, uh, those, what the, what those metabolites um, and the microbial excretions are what create stable humus in the soil, which, which you know, is that long lasted organic matter in the soil. So you can think of, think of plants as just like little solar powered pumps, just pumping organic matter into the soil that's custom tailored to the microbes at, at their root in their rhizosphere um, that then create humus in that process. So, so really photosynthesis is, is sort of the, the magic that we wanna maximize as, as farmers and really as, as you know, soil dwellers ourselves, um, we, we can't exist without soil. So let's, let's feed it. Um, yes, and it's the only source of renewable energy um, because all the other sources require all sorts of mining and extraction and fabrication to create the solar panels or, or wind power or turbines or what have you, whereas plants, you know, grow themselves using the sun as energy. So pretty, pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing mechanism. Let's, let's maximize it. Um, farmers are harvesters of the sun and plants are, are the, the way we harvest it. Um, so, so yeah, when you look out at the farm or the land you're growing on, a pretty quick assessment of how well you're doing with photosynthesis is just how much green do you see? You should um, ideally see mostly green and very little brown. Um, if, if, you're, you know, if your land is brown a lot of the year, then that's just missed potential for photosynthesis and for creating new soil. Um, diversity is, uh, is you know that diversity below ground all the different organisms that that feed plant roots um, they also impart all sorts of other benefits um, they they release nutrients they provide disease resistance um, to the plants um, and and just resiliency in the face of pests um, they clean the air and the water um, they they provide they make food more nutrient dense, more nutritious. Uh, without life, um, you know, food lacks the vigor that that it can't impart to us the same vigor as as living uh, living food can. Um, so yeah, it leads to human health, and this all makes sense because uh, yeah, when we nurture this web of life, it nurtures us because actually we are part of this web of life. So when we, when we feed and nurture the soil, we are actually literally feeding and nurturing our, ourselves. Um, we are, um, you know, we're as terrestrial organisms, we are part of this soil food web. And it's easy to forget that in our, you know, human made world. Um, but, but yeah, we're, we're a part of this web and, uh, if we, if we mistreat it, we're mistreating ourselves. Um, so yeah, talking about soil coverage, I have this little clip from YouTube um, on what happens when water falls on bare soil versus soil covered in either living plants or, or mulches. Um, so hopefully this will work through Zoom. It's just a couple minutes long. Um, but I, I uh, I could describe it, well, but a uh, picture's worth a thousand words, hopefully. Here we go. So two watering cans filled with the same amount of water. One is watering a tub of bare soil, and the other is watering a tub of, the same tub of soil, but with plants growing in it. And you can see the one with bare soil is already flowing. There's already water draining out of it, and the water is dark brown. So it's carrying with it nutrients and soil particles um, causing erosion. The other tub hasn't even started or it just started draining now and it's clear water. There's no soil particles uh, flowing out in it. Um, so you can really see the difference um, that soil coverage makes. Ideally that soil coverage is living plants because then the roots are also holding everything in place. But um, if you aren't you know, if you need to transition between crops and don't have living plants, at least we can keep a layer of mulch um, on top of the soil to prevent that, some of that erosion. 
hopefully you all can see that. I realize I have no way to like gauge people's engagement in this. So hopefully I'm not talking to an empty room. Um, <laughs> it looks great, Daniel. Awesome. Thanks, Bo. I needed that. <laughs> <laughs> we can see it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, maybe you can represent uh, people's, uh, you know, if, if people are really asking questions or needing me to speed up or slow down, feel free to direct me. Normally, I look out at the audience and I'm like, okay, people are falling asleep. I'll go a little faster, but I can't see anybody in this case. Well, folks are giving you thumbs up and saying the pacing is great. So you're doing great. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, so, so yeah, and then the fourth principle is minimizing disturbance. So thinking about the um, sort of natural succession that wild spaces follow, um, you know, they start out with, um, you know, low growing plants, mosses, lichens, then the annuals move in, then the, the perennial, herbaceous perennials, and then the woody perennials, and you end up with the, the biggest woody perennials or, or trees um, with, the, with your sort of climax. That's sort of the natural progression that happens over, over you know, hundreds of years, um, usually. So there needs to be some kind of disturbance as farmers we need to disturb this natural succession, especially if we want to grow vegetables, because vegetables are down at the annual end of that spectrum. So we're, as vegetable growers, we're already asking a lot of nature to not progress the way it wants to, um, but to stay way back in the growing of annuals. So some sort of disturbance will be necessary. Um, but the goal is really to disturb as little as possible so that we can, you know, get back to that point of growing annuals. Um, so I would argue that tillage is way overkill. Tillage brings us back to, you know, completely bare, churned up, um, just fully disturbed soil. Whereas maybe we don't need to go back that far with that big a disturbance um, to get our, you know, desired successional response of, of growing vegetables. Um, so yeah, trying to minimize disturbance and, and we're constantly toying with ways to disturb just a little less and still be able to, you know, plant our next crop. Um, because if we didn't disturb at all, you know, the, you know, perennial weeds would move in and then shrubs would grow up and trees would grow up and next thing we're, we're trying to grow vegetables in the understory of a forest, which wouldn't work. Um, maybe for a few vegetables, but for most, they, they won't like full sun. So we have to kind of fight back that that succession, um, but let's do it as lightly as we can. That's sort of the goal. So yeah, thinking, taking that another step, um, this is my subjective view of this, but uh, sort of going from harsh to mild disturbance techniques. These are kind of the ones I thought up of in agriculture. You have your rototill, your plow, your disc, your harrow. Um, those are all kind of, you know, even the tilther, those are like soil working fast moving steel implements. Um, and then you have it, the sort of hand tools of broad fork and rake, which are slower moving, less, you know, they don't invert the soil. Um, so those are sort of slow moving steel. And then, then the other ones get more and more mild, um, you know, burning or flooding or mowing, tarping, mulching um, or crimping. Um, those are all above ground disturbances. So they, they kind of limit, or eliminate the, the soil disturbance and just apply uh, disturbance to the, to the ground above. Um, so just thinking of, you know, on this spectrum of harsh to mild, let's, you know, the more we can stay on the mild end, the better it is for soil health. Um, and yeah, what are we mimicking in nature, looking to nature as our model? Um, when we rototill or plow, like we're, we're mimicking natural disasters, basically, um, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, landslides. Um, that's the only time that soil really gets inverted um, and, and churned up that way. Um, so that's certainly natural, but it typically doesn't occur, you know, every season or multiple times a season. So do we really want to emulate that so often? Um, whereas the slow moving steel is a little bit more like burrowing animals um, or soil organisms. Uh, remember again, humans are soil organisms. So if we are using our own power and not a you know combustion engine then you know we're kind of in that category of slow moving animals moving the soil around um, and then mild yeah sort of mimics wildfires uh, 
grazing habits of animals um, or just the shading of overstory plants as they grow up naturally and, and sort of drop their leaves and mulch out um, plants below. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the principles background um, to all this. And now we'll talk about how we actually implement some of that on the farm. So these are the different practices. I'll, I'll breeze through with much more photos. Uh, I promised photos and so far there haven't been many, so sorry about that, but a lot of photos coming up. Um, so yeah, these are our practices. Uh, no till, uh, so no disturbance of the soil or very little as little as possible. Um, mulching, so by that I mean organic mulches, um, leaves, wood chips, straw, um, uh, plastic mulch, I don't actually consider a true mulch because it's, uh, it's impervious, so it, it doesn't function like a natural mulch does. Um, it's also, you know, kind of unsustainable and synthetic material and uh, that has to be thrown out at the end of the year. Um, so also leaving crop residues um, rather than you know, tilling them in or removing them, um, just try to leave as much in place as possible, kind of mimicking more natural systems. Um, and then fitting in as many cover crops as possible. Um, that's a big part of this next section is how do we fit in as many cover crops as possible, but also not till, um, since tillage is often how people get things back to a plantable state after cover cropping. Um, and then, yeah, integrating livestock, Multi-cropping, also known as interplanting or companion planting. Um, under sowing, which is really just another version of uh, interplanting. And then uh, integrating perennial hedgerows. Uh, so perennial flowers and beneficial plants, um, integrating those into our crop fields. Um, so those are some of the practices I'll show pictures of. And, uh, and just to tie that back in with the principles, so these are sort of the, the boxes they check. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, those principles are, are really trying to, you know, help, help guide us toward uh, a more natural type of soil health, which is uh, sort of sustainable in the long term. So yeah, starting with no-till, these are some, some permanent no-till beds. Um, all of our all of our vegetable beds are grown this way. They're they're permanent in that we don't move them ever. They're just once they're formed, that's where they are. Um, they're they're raised beds, just slightly raised. Um, that's mostly just so we know where they are. Because if it were all flat, it would be harder to to mark where the beds are. Um, so we know where to walk. We don't walk on our beds um, to allow you know to reduce compaction. Um, and there's full soil coverage, so we. My, my mantra is sort of never see the soil. Um, any, any time we start to see soil, we'll add some sort of cover to it. Um, you know, either, either compost on top of the beds as, as a sort of mulch layer or leaves in the paths or wood chips in the paths, or, um, you know, we've used, we use bark mulch on the beds sometimes too. And ideally then we'd also get living plants on the bed as, as much as possible since remember photosynthesis is, is the number one goal of um, soil health is, is to keep those beds covered in living, living growth. So yeah, the gist of our no-till system is, you know, when a, when a crop comes out um, at the end of the season, if it's too late to plant a cover crop, which I'll talk more about later, but if it's, if it's too late for that, then we'll just mulch the beds um, here with leaves. We'll rake these out so that it's a seamless soil coverage. And then that protects the, the soil from erosion from rain and snow over the winter. And uh, in the spring, we just rake those leaves off into the paths and plant right into the bed. So that's sort of as simple as it gets really. Um, and, and yeah, we might add a little bit of uh, fertilizer in the holes as we transplant, or we might rake in a little bit into the surface if it, if it needs it. Um, or if the soil is starting to show through, we might rake off the leaves mulch on top, um, just so that we're not seeing that soil. Because remember, anytime rain hits bare soil, there is, some kind of erosion underway. There's just no way around that. Um, you know, when that rain hits a soil particle, that the small particles get 
dissolve in that droplet of rain. And as that rain flows through the soil, it carries those small particles downward with it. It fills up the pore space down low. Next thing you know, all that pore space is filled up and the water can't percolate anymore. So it takes those fine particles and it runs off with them. Um, and that's, that's sort of how erosion occurs. So even if you don't see runoff happening at the surface, there's micro erosion happening with those pore spaces being filled anytime your rain hits bare soil. So, so yeah, that's why we really try to never see the soil. Um, because even if it's hitting a, a layer of, of compost or bark mulch, that doesn't have those fine, fine soil particles, you know, those sort of clay silt particles, um, then that water can just, it absorbs the impact and then that water percolates slowly into the soil without um, absorbing it. Um, so anyway, bit of a tangent there. So, so yeah, we rake off our beds and plant into them. That's sort of the gist of our no-till system. Um, that's it at its simplest. Um, and then flipping between crops, you know, the carrots, gets direct seeded right after the lettuce head comes out, lettuce heads come out, and all we did was sort of rake the bed out a little bit in between to flatten it out um, so the seeder would go through it easily. Um, so, so yeah, very, very simple, no-till. It's, it's more defined by what it isn't than by what it is. Um, it's, a, it's almost a lack of practices. We just, you know, once those beds are formed, that's where they are and we seed into them. Hey, Daniel, we just have a quick clarifying question. When you say fertilizer, do you mean compost or are there other things that you're adding when you're preparing that? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so in the early days, I just added compost um, and that was the fertilizer. Um, now, you know, to keep the soil balanced um, and not add too much phosphorus, I do add sort of organic fertilizer, um, alfalfa meal, feather meal, um, sort of things without a lot of phosphorus. Um, so that will be organic fertilizer that we rake in. Um, and yeah, basically we're removing so much nutrients in the crops each year that I feel it's necessary to add at least, you know, that much back in to sort of keep that, that balance. Um, and and uh, potassium too will add, um, you know, either langbionite or, or potassium sulfate a little bit um, just to offset what we're removing in the crop. And yeah, just rake that into the surface or put it in the transplant holes as we transplant. Um, and that's, we do that according to a soil test. So every fall I test each plot and see what the nutrients are. And if it doesn't need it, we don't add it. Um, so yeah, never see the soil. Um, I say that a lot, um, but it also just makes the farm feel it creates a feel to the land that just feels right. It's like when you walk through the forest, just it has that same feel of like, there's, a, there's an insulating layer of organic matter over protecting the soil. The soil is kind of like the internal organs of, of the earth. So, you know, it needs that skin over it. Um, so yeah, and then we leave crop residues. Here's uh, some lettuce mix seeded right through the old arugula stalks um, and we just don't uh, we don't worry as much about you know that perfect fluffed up leveled seed bed um, you know a quick rake to get the big chaff into the paths is all we, we give it and then uh, direct seed right into that with the earthway so that's uh, yeah that's no till at a in a nutshell um, and then uh, here's here's cover cropping. How we how we fit cover crops into that. Um, so two two scenarios. Keep it simple here in the interest of time. Uh, the first is sort of one of the the I'd say sort of the gateway to cover cropping uh, is is peas and oats. Um, they're pretty low stakes uh, seeded in the fall um, or in the spring, but seeded in the fall they'll they'll winter kill in our climate here in Maine. Um, so there's not too much worry about having them, you know, dealing with them later, which is great for a no-till system. So we don't have to worry about, you know, how we're going to terminate them in the spring. Um, so yeah, we, we plant peas and oats where next year's early spring crops are going. Um, that way the peas and oats winter kill, we can just rake the chaff into the paths in the early spring and plant right into that bed um, without any other soil work. 
Um, a uh, more sort of next level uh, cover cropping combo would be rye and crimson clover um, or rye and vetch. Um, and that we seed in beds that won't be planted until the summer of the next season because that rye puts on most of its growth in the, in the spring. Um, in our climate here, we terminate that around, um, or we knock it down around, you know, the beginning of June. Um, so that, you know, it, it knocks out early spring crops, like there's not time, not, there's no way to plant that after rye, but um, at least how we do it. Um, but then for crops like our second succession of summer squash or Brussels sprouts um, or winter squash, transplant really nicely into the rye stubble and I'll, I'll show that. Um, Cause yeah, cover crops are a great way to maximize photosynthesis in the off season or even in the on season. Um, they, they're just typically gonna photosynthesize and feed the soil much more than our cash crops will or can, especially over the winter. And winter rye is like the workhorse of cover crops um, for, cold, for cold weather. It just grows really well. It'll stay green all winter, you know, photosynthesizing even as the, even as it's largely dormant um, and then regrow with a vengeance in the spring. So it's a really great soil builder. So yeah, this is how that looks. Uh, so here's the peas and oats. These are actually spring, seed, spring seeded peas and oats, I think seeded in April. Um, this is what they look like when they're ready to be <coughs> uh, terminated. You know, they've been pretty full flower there. Um, they flower around the same time peas and oats um, and they're ready to be they at this point they pretty much want to die so it's pretty easy to <clears throat> to kill them um, and we used to flail mow them um, with the the flail mower on the BCS walking tractor there um, but that chopped up the residues so finely that I found they break they broke down very quickly um, which might be nice if you don't want the residues around but we actually want those residues we want you know as much sort of mulch material on the surface as possible um, and we also want to try and minimize our disturbance the flail mower even though it's not disturbing the soil it's a pretty intense disturbance um, to the above ground portion of the soil probably killing any you know bugs and stuff that are in in that cover crop so now we have a um, uh, a method of knocking down the peas and oats um, this is a, this is a high tech method developed by some apprentices a couple years ago. See if I can get this to, to play. So this is a rolling, rolling the peas and oats. Um, with the, uh, the, the human, the human body, but we, uh, we also just stomped them down with a, with a T post, um, Two people stepping on a T-post in unison, just kind of crimp it down. Um, and that's enough to, to drag a tarp over it. Um, so then we tarp it for, for usually just about a week is plenty to kill it um, and really just make sure it's fully dead. Um, and then when those tarps come off, that's what it looks like. It's sort of this nice straw material. That's pea and oat straw. And it's also broken down enough that we can just rake it right into the paths. So that's what it looks like after it's been raked into the paths. And you can just see that that soil, you know, this we haven't added any compost to this after the peas and oats. Um, so you can just see how like fluffy and nice that soil is after after that cover crop. Um, and we just push the direct seeder through that. Uh, I think we were seeding storage radishes in this case, um, daikon and and black Spanish radishes and maybe some purple top turnips direct seeded in there. Um, and they came up um, nicely and, and there's the crop there in the, in the fall. Um, and, and yeah, we weeded this one time and there's just a handful of weeds because without that, without that soil disturbance, um, we're not churning up weed seed. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just a, a very low tech, method of feeding the soil, prepping the bed. Um, you know, there's no, we use no, no machines on this. Um, I don't think we even put fertilizer down. He's fixed some nitrogen and the soil just already has a lot of fertility in it. Um, so yeah, this sort of a nice low tech uh, human scale way of growing food. Sorry, I lost my cat. Cameo. 
Um, so yeah, that's the P's and O's. Um, Ryan Clover is similar, except they're uh, winter annuals. So they get seeded in the fall. Um, this is us seeding them with the Earthway seeder. Uh, we just have one person with rye seed, the next person with, with clover seed and stagger each, each pass with the Earthway. Um, do about 12, 12 or 14 rows in a bed. Our beds are all um, five feet on center. So about a 42 inch bed top. Um, and yeah, we just, it's about a, I think it's about a, a it's a few mile walk to, to seed the whole plot with the earthway, but that's well worth it because then we get a really good stand of, of rye and clover. Um, and we will irrigate that and weed it just like any other crop, just so we're not getting weed seed generated in there. And then the following spring, it, you know, explodes and is is five or six feet tall um, by by the end of May. And we'll knock it down with the T-post. The you can kind of see it there. There's a T-post that they're both stepping on in unison. And the, the edge of that T-post acts as a little bit of a crimper. But really, we're just trying to get it to lay flat so that we can drag tarps over it. Uh, here's another plot with rye. Um, and, and yeah, this, so this rye was like over six feet tall. We're dragging tarps over it. You can see on the right, um, that's the peas and oats that we seeded first thing in the spring. So that's only, only shin high. And we've already knocked down this six foot high, crazy rye jungle. So, so yeah, it, it shows the difference between if you, can, if you can overwinter a cover crop like rye, you'll just get that much more photosynthesis and, and soil health than um, a spring planted, you know, peas and oats. Um, yeah, we weigh it down with concrete blocks. I'm a fan of those over sandbags. Um, yeah, note how far the, the peas and oats are behind, um, seeded in April. Um, then when we, we pull that tarp off, we have this nice rye straw that's grown in place, all matted down, and we, we transplant right through that um, with, uh, I think this is storage cabbage in this one. Um, but yeah, it works yeah. great with, with squash, cucumbers, tomatoes, um, yeah, uh, Brussels sprouts, any, anything that's sort of widely spaced and transplanted. Because it is a little harder to transplant through um, than, you know, a bare bed of soil or compost. Um, you kind of have to work through that, that straw and dig a little bit to loosen the, the roots of the rye that are they're still in there. Um, but then you have this sort of wonderful mulched bed. And, uh, and yeah, here's the cabbage later that fall that uh, did pretty well. We didn't row cover it or anything. So it has a little bit of cabbage looper, but not too bad. Daniel, can you clarify um, those peas and oats that you showed, were those spring planted? Yes, they were seeded. I think I have it here. Yeah, April 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, about as early as we tend to direct seed things outside here because the soil's pretty cold before then. So yeah, those are spring planted and, and yeah, only, yeah, only what, six, six or 12 inches tall. And that rye was already seven feet tall and, and like lignified carbon. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's cover cropping, two two examples anyway. Um, live integrating livestock into that. Here's here's another plot of uh, rye and clover. This is in the fall, so it it was seeded in September. This is in October. Um, we run the turkeys over them. Um, we're 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 taking a break from livestock this year, but we've raised lots of poultry um, every other year in the past. Um, so yeah, we run a hundred turkeys over the plot just for just for I think it was three or four days. They graze it down. It looks like that afterwards. We leave enough so that it's still going to regrow and soak up all the nutrients that the turkeys kindly deposited. And uh, yeah, I, I, my my punchline for that is we call this uh, turkeys on rye, turkey on rye. Um, and then we move them back to the. We have sort of a perimeter of of pasture around the farm that they can cycle through and then pop into any plot that has cover crop on it. 
Um, so, so that's where they are here. Um, that's a really, it's just a really great way to, uh, to integrate the animals in and bring that diversity. Um, again, our, our goals here are, are photosynthesis. So the cover crop is fully green covering the soil, bringing in the diversity of, of the livestock. We also have a diverse mix of species in the cover crop. In this one, I think there's uh, oats, barley, uh, peas, clover, and daikon radish. Um, and then, you know, it's fully covered soil and, and it's minimal disturbance. Like the, the, the disturbance here is just the animals grazing it down and fertilizing it. Um, and this is next year's fertility. Um, you know, we've, we're buying in the fertilizer in the form of turkey feed and having the turkeys spread it for us for the next crop. Um, doing this in the fall also works really well because the organic standard mandates a 120 day waiting period after you apply raw manure. So doing that over the winter works really well because you don't lose out on, on growing time. Um, so yeah, talking about mulches. Um, mulches are nature's form of weed control. Um, the only time you don't see green plants growing on healthy soil is when it's covered in a layer of, of sort of dead plant material or, or mulch. So, so yeah, this is straw on our garlic one year. Um, and it's just really nice to feel like we're preventing weeds rather than constantly having to kill weeds. Um, this feels like we're kind of working with natural principles instead of fighting that natural urge to have that bare soil be covered. Um, Cause that's what weeds, weeds are trying to do. They, they function as nature's band-aids. They're trying to heal what is a wound to the earth, which is bare soil. Um, so by constantly killing the weeds, we're just sort of constantly keeping that wound open and bare, um, allow, you know, ready, ready for erosion. Um, so yeah, it feels good to just cover that soil and not worry about the weeds as much. Um, so this is leaves. We mulch, uh, we use a lot of leaves. We get leaves from our municipality here in Scarborough, sort of a benefit of being in suburbia. Um, mulch our garlic with leaves. Um, we also get wood chips from local landscapers. Um, so yeah, really wherever you are, um, a big part of farming the way we do is, is searching out these local connections for, for biomass, any kind of, you know, plant, dead plant material, um, whatever that might be. Uh, yeah, I think here in the Northeast, there's, there's just lots of leaves and wood chips. We have lots of, uh, you know, there's a lot of trees around and, wherever people and trees live near each other, there tend to be a lot of leaves and wood chips that get collected. Um, so another, another soil health practice is multi-cropping or interplanting. Um, and uh, so one easy way to think about this is take, start with your large slow growing plants. Solanaceae are particularly good examples of that. Um, and then combine those with small fast growing plants um, you know so while while your peppers and eggplants are still small and growing out you can grow a crop in between them before they close their canopy so it's a great way to cover the soil with more photosynthesis and also get more production um, out of that area so those are sort of natural pairings um, i'll go through some examples um, then there's also this concept of uh of my mycorrhizal plants versus non-mycorrhizal plants so real quick, mycorrhizal fungus is uh, literally fungus of the root, myco being fungus, rhizo being root. Um, they're, they're species of fungus that form beneficial symbiotic relationships with plant roots <clears throat> and extend the, the reach of those roots deep into the soil. Um, they can you know, multiply the root soil contact by a hundred or even a thousand times um, just to gain more access to nutrients, to gain more access to water. They provide disease resistance um, to the plant. They also interlace with other mycorrhizal networks of other plants and form a communication network. Amazing. Um, it's, it's pretty much magic. I, I think this is magic and, you know, science will never explain it all, but they've injected like radioactive isotopes into tree species. And, and then like that 
exact isotope shows up miles away in a different tree species, like it traveled via the mycorrhizal network. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot happening underground via these, the, what Paul Stamets calls the nature's internet, um, the, the mycorrhizal network that interconnects all these different plants. Um, so yeah, without going down that rabbit hole, um, there are some plants that don't form mycorrhizal connections. Um, very few in general, I think it's only about 5% of terrestrial plants don't form some kind of mycorrhizal connection, but a, a lot of the plants we grow as vegetable farmers are among those, that 5%. So the, anything in the cabbage family, anything in the beet family does not form mycorrhizal connections. So I like to pair those uh, crops with crops that do um, support the fungal population, because otherwise, we can kind of starve out the mycorrhizal population of the soil without its lifeline. It needs living plant roots to, to survive and thrive. So here's an example. Um, we under sow our kale to parsley. Parsley is a great fungal crop um, and also just great that it's, it's low growing, it's biennial, so it doesn't set seed the first year. For us, typically it winter kills, so it's not you know, a big problem to manage in the field. Um, and, uh, and we can harvest it um, if, if we need it. So, so yeah, we under sow kale um, to parsley, um, and that's a great combination. We'll do that right before the kale canopy closes. So the, sort of the last minute that we can push the earthway cedar through, we'll, we'll do rows of parsley around the kale. <clears throat> um, another example is uh, Brussels sprouts here. This is planted into our crimped rye, um, like I showed earlier. Um, but the Brussels sprouts eventually get huge, but they start out pretty small. So in the meantime, we, we can get a crop of lettuce out of the middle between the Brussels sprout rows. And lettuce is fungal, so it'll, it'll feed the mycorrhizal fungus a little bit um, uh, while, while those Brussels sprouts are growing. Um, and we're just getting, you know, it's that much more soil coverage, that much more photosynthesis to feed the soil. Here, um, it, easy interplantings are, are, you know, with things like tomatoes that just have a single row down the middle of a bed that leaves the shoulders of the bed open for something. So here's, here's parsley down the, down the side of the tomato beds, um, or uh, there's bok choy and hakari turnips down the side of the cucumber beds in the high tunnels. Um, that works well too, because uh, in the summer, you know, these crop, the, those brassicas don't need as much uh, sunlight. Um, so they, they can get shaded out a little bit, stay a little cooler even than, than if they were in full sun. Um, here's another uh, interplanting, um, carrots and ginger together. We grow ginger in one of our high tunnels and we, we direct seed carrots um, a little before we put the ginger in. Um, so that, uh, yeah, the ginger comes up and, and it shoots up pretty fast so it doesn't get shaded out by the carrots, but then the carrots get pulled out and it leaves room for the ginger to, to you know, fill out the bed later. Uh, here are radishes uh, interplanted with onions. Here's some more carrots on the outdoor tomato beds. Here's uh, spinach on the shoulders of the, the pea beds. Again, spinach is in the beet family. That's, uh, that's a non-mycorrhizal crop, um, but peas are, are fungal friendly, so sort of a nice combination. Also, by the time the peas are done, the spinach is bolted and ready to come out, so that, that timing works out well. Um, so yeah, under sowing um, onions with sweet alisum is a nice uh, sort of uh, beneficial flower. Um, in the brassica family, um, but it has very sort of sh weak shallow root system, so it doesn't tend to compete with with crops um, and just flowers all season long attracting all sorts of lovely pollinators and uh, beneficial insects. Um, we also stick it under between our tomato plants um, in row and then on the shoulders uh, the uh, there are beets in this in this picture. So again, trying to trying to look out at the farm and see you know living plants growing everywhere. Even at this picture on the 
on the left, I see a lot of bare soil there. I, we could have planted more alisum, like it could just be a carpet of alisum in there um, to sort of minimize that, that brown. We want to see green, green everywhere. Um, one question, just clarifying, did you plant the peas and the spinach at the same time? And how do you manage the timing on these intercroppings? Yeah, yeah, it's hard. Um, the peas and the spinach, yes, I think, I think we did. Or you know what, we, we let the peas come up. I think they were about six inches tall and then we put the spinach in um, because the danger is the spinach might come up faster than the peas and shade out the little pea seedlings. So with all these interplantings, uh, timing is key and spacing is key. Um, so there's, it definitely is, is harder um, to grow this way. Um, because it adds those sort of complications, but I think the, the, that's the risk, but the reward is, you know, a greater overall productivity, um, more soil coverage. So yeah, definitely tweaking the timing of this is, is all important and the spacing. Um, so yeah, those peas wait till they're, wait till they're, you know, four inches tall. And then we seeded the spinach just to make sure the spinach wouldn't outcompete the peas. Good, good question. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I definitely, if you're just starting farming or gardening, maybe don't go crazy with the interplantings because it definitely complicates management um, a fair amount. Um, and then I think this is one of the last things, uh, hedgerows. So integrating perennial sort of beneficial plantings into the vegetable fields. Um, I did that a few years ago and it's been one of my favorite favorite practices on the farm um, ever since. Uh, it just creates these beautiful strips of, of perennial flowering um, diversity, um, which act as a reserve for soil organisms. Um, you know, that, that mycelial network is alive and well with perennials usually. Um, so it can kind of act as a bank right next to our crop beds that, you know, that diversity can seep out into, into the beds um, from that, from these sort of central beneficial beds. Um, it's beneficial insect habitat. Um, it adds economic diversity because it just so happens that a lot of the thing, a lot of the flowering plants that are good for, for beneficial insects are also produce, uh, you know, berries or fruit or flowers that can be cut and sold in bouquets. Um, uh, culinary and medicinal herbs, um, all those can be, you know, part of this beneficial bed. It doesn't have to be a single purpose uh, bed. And then it's also just a beautiful strip of colorful diversity right, you know, throughout the farm um, that makes makes customers happy, makes the crew happy, makes me happy, and, and uh, it's hard to put a, a value on that, but it's definitely worth something. Um, so yeah, here's some shrub ideas for the hedgerow. Depending on how, how big you want your hedgerow, um, these are taller shrubs, eight to 15 feet. Generally shrubs are about as wide as they are tall. So, you know, if, if they're eight to 15 feet tall, you know, expect your hedgerow to be eight to 15 feet wide as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's very easy to plant, you know, plant a narrow strip of these little twigs that are shrubs, but then they'll grow and grow and take overtake your bed. So sort of plan accordingly. If you want your hedgerow to be 15 feet wide, these are these are great species, um, sort of native flowering bushes and uh, and you know, even dwarf fruit trees, hazelnuts. Um, or if you want your hedgerow to be much more compact and stick to you know four to six feet wide and tall, um, there are all these you know chokeberries, honeyberries, blueberries, um, currants and gooseberries. Although they're not <coughs> legal in Maine currently. Um, and yeah, all those, all those other berries. And yeah, just to reiterate, a lot of these can be cash crops. Um, so it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to feel like a sacrifice of growing area for these hedgerows that can, that can be multi-purpose. Um, and then you get into the herbaceous perennials, um, as opposed to the shrubby woody perennials. So the, um, these tend to be, you know, they don't take up as much space, um, which is great. And they also just all these beneficial insects are looking for. Um, so the goal here is to have multiple 
uh, multiple species flowering throughout the entire season. So a continuous supply of, you know, a diverse selection of nectar throughout the whole season. So I've sort of organized them here from bloom period early to late. Um, and yeah, again, the goal is overlapping blooms, bloom periods for, for these flowers. So, you know, any, if you look at them in, in April, May, June, July, August, September, right through into November, you should always see multiple different flowers in, in bloom because um, that's what the insects are looking for. Um, and then you have your native grasses, which are great habitat for overwintering. Um, so yeah, here's, here's one of ours, of our beneficial beds in the spring. You know, the sage and the, the chives are flowering. Um, the delphinium and, uh, and then later in the fall, you have more of your, um, there's the milkweeds and yarrow, of course, goes all season long. Um, but there's anis hyssop. Um, yeah, all the different species in there. And, and, we, and we stuck um, birdhouses in these beds too. They're a great place for birdhouses and, you know, birds are great diversity to add to the farm. They, uh, they sing at you while you work and they, uh, they eat some pests. Um, and they just make, yeah, they bring life to the farm. It's amazing. We put these birds boxes up and within days, it felt like the, the farm was just covered in, covered in, uh, bluebirds and, and swallows. So then there's also just all the little nooks and crannies of your farm. You can, you know, pack full of flowering diversity, um, to help with, with pests and, and just to create a, a healthy ecosystem, which is, you know, all feeding the soil. Um, you can also just stop mowing every last inch of the of the field. You can leave little patches to to you know follow natural succession into into wildflowers. Um, <clears throat> here's the, the goldenrod and aster of, of late fall. Um, so yeah, soil health is is beautiful. It should be beautiful to the senses. Um, and uh, yeah, if 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 it doesn't feel beautiful when you when you're walking around the soil, like chances are the soil is not healthy. Um, soil health is also delicious. Um, it leads to nutrient density and just the quality, the taste of of the vitality of food. Um, and uh, as John Hayden said of uh, in one workshop, he's he wrote uh, farming on the wild side. He said we're all soil having a human experience. So. To the extent we can embrace that um, and accept that we are the soil, then maybe it's easier to care for it, um, since without it we we can't exist. Um, yeah, and here's a shameless plug um, for my book that's coming out this fall. Um, coming out in November. Uh, yeah, it's a basically everything I just showed you, but in lots more detail. Um, Feel free to support that if you want. Um, and that's it. All right, so now maybe I'll let Bo facilitate the question and answer. Awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. I, every time I like visit your farm or like pictures of it, I'm just like, oh man, that's so dreamy. Um, <laughs> great, great inspiration. Um, so you can uh, stop screen sharing so you can see right. your beautiful face while you're talking. Um, so I hope some questions were answered throughout Daniel talking. I kind of interjected with some clarifying things about what you were hitting on. So what I'm going to do is go through a few that stood out and were repeated, and then we can open it up to more questions. So as we talk, feel free to add more questions in the chat box. Um, so this is a personal favorite of mine, but can you talk about how um, you started and if the model you currently have is what you started with, how did that evolve to be where you are today? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely been a evolution, a journey. Um, I, I didn't have, I didn't really know much at all starting out. so. So I certainly didn't start with all these practices. Um, I I started, you know, I read Elliot Coleman's New Organic Grower, and that was about all that I could find to read for sort of the small scale market gardening that I wanted to do. Um, 
And then I read just sort of general books on soil health and a lot of those agreed or sort of said, you know, tillage is really bad for the soil, but, uh, but we just have to do it because we're farmers and that's what we do. Um, and so I, I, it didn't really sit right with me and I guess I didn't know any better. Like I hadn't, I didn't have a model of sort of tillage to work off of. So I, I just figured why, you know, once those beds are formed, why keep tilling them? So I just started experimenting with, you know, just spreading a layer of compost and planting right into that. And had really good results with that. And it's just less work, required less machinery. Um, so I, I sort of stuck with that and then started integrating in more, more cover cropping as I felt more confident. And, uh, and then it was natural to run the animals over that because, um, so yeah, it was sort of a, a iterative learning process um, more than, a, you know, this is how I'm going to farm and then doing it. Um, one farmer asked about your plant spacing. Do you think you would have um, changed anything uh, looking back? Like, for example, your 42 inch spacing, would you have changed that? Or are you still happy with that decision? I'm still happy with that decision. I'm, I'm six foot four. So like the ergonomics of that work well. Um, so I don't know, maybe I should talk to my smaller employees and, and see what they think. But, uh, but yeah, like, I think it's easy enough to step over those beds and to lean into the middle. Um, and just the, the spatial efficiency of wider, you know, the wider your bed, the less of your land is devoted to path space. Um, so it's that trade-off between ergonomics and spatial efficiency. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with the five feet on center, although I know a lot of farmers are happy with the four feet on center and the 30 inch bed. That's, I think that's what Jean-Martin Fortier sort of talks about in his book, The Market Gardener. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm, I, I wouldn't argue for either one of those over the other. I think it's sort of personal preference. Yeah, a few people also um, asked about this transition um, to no-till production if, for example, they're starting with really heavy weed pressure. I think the person asked specifically around amaranth and bindweed and how do you break that cycle of tillage? So say you're already in this cycle of tilling, how would you suggest people transition to no tillage production? Yeah, totally. No, that's hard. Um, I think first off, I feel like you have to kill those uh, perennial weeds. Um, so if you have bindweed rhizomes, um, if you have quackgrass rhizomes, you got to get those dead. <laughs> um, so for that, tarping is great. Um, or if you're just going to tarp the once, it's actually less of an environmental impact to get disposable plastic. Um, you know, till the beds up one last time, form raised beds, and cover them in black plastic. And then you can grow in them while they're smothering those weeds. And that black plastic over the course of the season, you know, should get hot enough that it'll smother pretty much any remaining perennial roots in there. Um, and, it, you know, it's not going to cook out all your annual weed seed. Um, but then if you take that plastic off, spread a, you know, a good layer of compost on top. And if that compost is weed free, you just created this sort of weed barrier that you can plant right into and you're not disturbing that soil again so all those weed seeds are sort of you know tucked away just out of sight and and maybe some of them will, will work their way up through but hopefully that would be a more manageable weeding prospect um, so yeah i think breaking that cycle is you can use you know some kind of plastic to to kill the perennials and then just spread a layer of of plantable material and plant through that do you think this method would work? Um, I guess, could you talk a little bit about the soil type that you're working with and if this would work on really heavy clay soil that some folks find in Maine? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, my soil is not that. It's a loamy sand, so very far on the sand end of the spectrum, um, pretty drought prone, um, especially if it were tilled. Um, so I have used it on a sort of not full on clay, but like a silty clay loam um, on a field I leased and it worked great. Um, I know a farmer doing it on much more clay heavy soils um, and he's just getting started. So I can't really 
report back too much on that. But I, my gut is that it, it would work um, on pretty much any agricultural soil. It might just take time. And that's, that's an important note too, is that don't expect to just go no-till and all of a sudden your crops are gonna explode and do great. Like it's a, it's a process. Um, you know, all, the, all that soil life has to really, it's a biological pace, not a mechanical pace. So the, the worms and the microbes and everything have to kind of m mellow and mix on, at their own pace. And then after a year or two of no-till, you'll start to see the benefits of that soil structure um, and extra soil health. And that's a year or two of no-till with full soil coverage and as much growing plants as possible. That's, you know, just the act of just not tilling. Like if you leave bare soil untilled, that's gonna be like the worst, like, you know, that's, that's very, that's not soil health. So you have to stop tilling and keep the soil covered and feed it as much as possible with living plants. Cool. Um, there were a handful of questions and I think one just came in as well about um, using the raw leaves and wood chips. Um, have you seen increased pest pressures or slug pressures because of that? And can you describe a little bit more like um, it's not broken down when you spread it. Um, so how has that influenced pest pressure? Um, there was a question about organic certification. So if you could talk about that mm -hmm. as a material that you use, um, that'd be great. Totally, totally. So um, yeah, the, the pest pressure, I think there is potential for like slugs um, with wood chips and leaves because um, it does keep the soil moist, which is what, you know, slugs like. Um, but that's also what a lot of other organisms like. Um, so to, to dry out your soil, I don't know, it feels like throwing out the baby with the bathwater to dry out your soil to keep the slugs away. I think I found I had slug issues um, sort of right when I started out with a lot of mulches, but by the next year even, they were much diminished. Um, obviously depends on the weather too, if it's super rainy, but I feel like there are natural predators of slugs that if you're not tilling, those predators will eventually move in. And that's kind of a theme of all of this is just to have that sort of long-term perspective and patience to get past the hump of, of the transition because all these other organisms will start to move in. If you create this habitat and you stop destroying it with, with fast moving steel, you know, the amphibians, the snakes, the, the frogs, the toads, um, you know, the parasitic insects will, will move in and start to help balance out those, those pest problems over time. Um, maybe not a satisfying answer for the like immediate slug problem you have right now, but, but I think taking that long-term view can actually be rewarding in, in the long-term. Was there more to that question? Oh, so um, organic certification. There was, oh, organic certification. And I was trying to find the link on the website, um, but yeah. Yeah, so I had a, I had a healthy yeah. discussion with Mafka when I was using the leaves. Um, so I think it's, it depends on your certifier and having that conversation because they um, initially they wanted an affidavit from every single person dropping off leaves, you know, at the town transfer stations saying that they were free of contaminants, um, you know, pesticides or whatever. Um, but I, I convinced Mafka to let me use them because I wait <clears throat> late enough in the season that there's no grass clippings mixed in. Um, Cause people love to spray a, a lot of stuff on their lawns, but generally don't spray too much on their trees. So if you wait till all the lawn clippings are gone, cycled through, um, and then you start getting just pure leaves, um, Mafka was satisfied that the, the risk was low enough that it was worth using. It seems a shame to like not be able to use local leaves on an organic farm. That's my personal take. Um, but yeah, definitely waiting until those grass clippings are, are out of there since there's probably a bunch of gunk you don't want in the, in the grass clippings. Awesome. Thanks. Um, there are a few questions about seed saving. Do you seed save anything? Just our garlic currently, but that's definitely an area I'm interested in. And, and one of the apprentices this year is actually experimenting with, with a bunch of different uh, trials. So hopefully, hopefully more of that um, currently, not much. Awesome. Um, process of opening up new fields. 
So it sounds like you're, you know, right now you're pretty maxed out on space, but could you talk about the process when you were first starting those fields? How did you go about it and how long did it take you to prep those fields? Sure. Once um, with the, the rotary plow on the BCS walking tractor. Um, and we'll, so that's definitely, you know, intensive tillage um, and it breaks up the soil a lot. And, um, but the, the nice thing about the rotary plow is it, ejects the soil to the side so then after it's all tilled up we can make a pass up and down each path and then we have a raised bed um, so we form the raised beds with that rotary plow and then we'll black plastic those those raised beds by hand just roll out the black plastic and bury the edges um, and all of that is you know not no-till, not ecologically friendly really, but, um, but it's that one time step to both smother those perennial roots and be able to grow a crop at the same time. Um, and then we'll, we'll, you know, at the end of the season that plastic comes off and we'll either plant a cover crop in, into those beds um, or, uh, or mulch them for the, for the next season. Cool. Do you feel like you're being interrogated yet? <laughs> no, not too bad. Okay. <laughs> um, there was a question about foliar feeding. So do you foliar feed? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I haven't before, but I did go do um, uh, like John Kempf's intensive. Um, John Kempf is a farmer consultant in Ohio. I think he's based out of, but he's, uh, he's a big proponent of foliar feeds and uh, yeah, I think I think I caught a little bit of the bug there, but I haven't uh, I haven't done any yet. Um, and his yeah, his argument is compelling. I've always you know followed the sort of organic philosophy of feed feed the soil, not the plant, and the soil will in turn feed the plant. But kind of like I was talking about with the liquid carbon pathway, the way to feed the soil is with the plant. So if we're feeding the plant, we're actually feeding the soil, which then refeeds the plant. So so yeah, I, I sort of um, sort of yeah I, I drank that kool-aid a little bit i think it's been it's been percolating and uh i'm i'm excited to experiment with that a little bit cool um let's see um there's questions about specifically when using the leaves do you find issues planting into uncomposted raw plant material um isn't it often preferable to have plant debris composted for soil microbe availability and I'd say this is linked to another question that just came in around, oh, sorry, Andrew. Um, do you want to unmute yourself and specify? Maybe you're talking about the cover crop? Yeah, exactly. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Yeah, um, I was kind of curious. I mean, I always remember learning that a lot of times it's preferable to compost organic matter because if you put straight uncomposted plant material into a soil you're then going to have problem with nutrient availability for the plants because there's going to be a surge in that soil microbe activity trying to compost that material totally yeah i think that's true um the key in our situation is that we're not mixing it into the soil um, i think if you were to till in that carbon rich material it would tie up nitrogen it would, you know, it would be like a party for the microbes and they'd forget about the plant roots for a little while. Um, but we're not, we're not mixing it in. We're just putting it right on top um, where it does. I find it has very little effect on nutrient availability because it's, you know, it's creating habitat for organisms right under it, but it's not, you know, pulling nutrients up from the, the soil. Yeah, even, even wood chips I've, you know, I use, on, I would use on top of beds if there were no risk of them sort of mixing in as we transplanted. Um, but I, I do keep those off the beds because yeah, as you dig that little hole for the transplant, if a couple wood chips fall in, I think that would have a really, uh, that would tie up a lot of nitrogen. There was a question earlier about what type of wood chips you were using, hardwood or softwood? Yeah, ideally hardwood, um, but it you know depends on what you have access to. Um, hardwood tends to facilitate the the fungal populations that are most beneficial to vegetables. 
Um, softwoods tend to be more for fungals that are friendly to coniferous trees and, and blueberries and, and, and other plants that we don't usually grow as vegetable farmers. Um, so, so yeah, ideally hardwood, if you can, if you have the choice, go for hardwood, uh, go for ramiel hardwood. Ramiel includes all the little sticks and twigs, um, the smaller diameter portions of the tree, because those have a much lower carbon to nitrogen ratio um, and just more nutrients in them too. Um, but I've used mixed wood chips as well. Um, I tend to just use wood chips in the paths um, because for that danger of them mixing in to the soil and tying up nitrogen. Whereas in the path, you know, we're not tilling, so those really never get mixed in. Um, similar on the nitrogen carbon ratio, someone's asking if you add nitrogen with your leaves. It sounds like you do add some like soybean meal and things like that. Yeah, I'll add, I'll add nitrogen based on a soil test and based on the crop we're planting. Um, I don't consider the leaves as a net loss of, you know, I wouldn't add more nitrogen just because we have leaves um, in the pads or on the beds. Um, but yeah, I do take a soil test for, you know, each plot individually in the fall and based on the um, recommendations for that, I'll add that much of, of different fertilizers to, to meet those needs. And who do you use for soil testing? University of Maine. Cool. Um, well, we have 52 people on here. I want to try to see if um, folks that want to ask a question could unmute themselves and we'll see if this causes chaos. And if it does, we can go back to this style of chat box, but I want to encourage people to use their voices. So um, if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself and we'll see how this goes. Hi, this is Judith, and I have a question. On our place, um, when I've been doing s like s vegetable seeds, the birds eat them all. We have a billion birds. And so would I have to do like remay over all my seeds every year, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, I guess we get crows eating some seeds, some bigger seeds. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I haven't had too much of an issue with that. Um, are you, are you, you said you're like seeding with, uh, are they buried? Like you're using an earthway or burying them over? I'm just covering them over lightly with soil, like carrot seeds. And um, any of the seeds um, haven't had much luck. So I'm growing most stuff in a greenhouse and transplanting, but I, I, I understand carrots aren't great for transplanting. So anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah, they, they have that long taproot that sends way down, so they'd be crooked if you transplant them. But I, yeah, I feel like the birds shouldn't eat all of the seed, especially fine seeds like that. It seems like uh, if it were buried, they'd have a trouble finding them all. But I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't had that problem. Yeah, maybe it's just the Northwest. They, um, uh, you can't grow peas here at all without, oh, and my friend in California growing uh, peas, they'll just eat them all. Yeah. Yeah, the crows definitely go for the peas. Uh, we pre-sprout our peas inside. Um, so when we put them out, they're immediately growing, not just sitting there. So maybe that helps somewhat. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. We want to try another person to unmute themselves. Ask a question. OK, we have um, a question that's related to markets. This is an interesting one. Um, are your markets very committed to your farm for their produce needs, or do you find any new or old farms competing? Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in a pretty populated area, so marketing is pretty different for me than for more rural farms. Um, there's, there's definitely some competition, but um, I, I feel like there's just enough demand that it's not an issue. So I, I think we have our, we have a pretty core customer base that's pretty loyal to us, both for CSA shares and at farmer's market. And we have a really good relationship with four natural food stores um, that I can count on year to year. So, so yeah, I'd say maybe more the, the former, the pretty committed. Um, I can count on being able to sell what we grow. Um, it's sort of a yeah a real benefit of trying to farm trying to find land you know close to where people live is marketing becomes less of an issue i have another quick question so we've had our place here in the northwest for 
about nine years and um, have always been a huge issue and blackberries which take over. So I've always avoided any landscape fabric because we're doing organic, but this, and mostly no till, but this year I couldn't take any more. So I, lands I did landscape fabric around my blueberry bushes and um, I wondered your thoughts on that. Uh, uh, you talk carping, but I have a, that about specifically about landscape fabric, especially I'm concerned about making sure water gets in and I find that the snakes just love it under there. So just your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the I hear those same the same thoughts. So, yeah, snakes love it under under landscape fabric, and it does let air and water through, which is a a real you know downside of of black plastic. Um, I'd say uh, yeah, I guess it's it's still not organic mulch, which is sort of what I strive for to you know emulate nature. Is it's you know organic mulches are both they're both the venue and the caterer for like a soil microbe party. Um, so there's, uh, whereas that any, any kind of synthetic material will, might help, you know, create, hold in moisture or prevent weeds, but it's not going to have that same like food and, and energy for, for the microbes. So I guess my thought would be, you know, tarp it or landscape fabric, what, whatever, to, to make sure those perennials are dead, those blackberries or what have you. Um, and then maybe try to work toward more organic mulches. But I, I totally understand that, you know, landscape fabric makes life so much easier sometimes. Um, or, you know, whatever, tarps with holes cut in them. I, um, I've, I've certainly used some of those techniques and they reduce labor a huge amount. Um, so, so we, we yeah. sorry, so we wood chip for many years. The weeds just grow right through the wood chips and it's uh, been really tough. So how thick of wood chips do you think we could do and avoid all the weeds that we, we're still, anyway. Yeah, yeah, so there's a real distinction between perennial weeds and annual weeds. Um, so perennial weeds will grow through just about anything. Um, and those are the ones that I really suggest trying to kill before you try to grow no-till vegetables. Um, otherwise, they'll just take right back over. You know, natural succession will already be started beyond your annual stage. Um, so, so with whether with tarps or with tillage or a combination, like kill those perennial roots, um, because then after that, the annual weed seed, you know, for an annual weed seed to germinate or to prevent that from germinating, you really only need an inch or two of mulch. Um, so if you go three or four inches of mulch, then you're, you're really safe um, for preventing annual weed seed from germinating. Um, very different than if you have blackberry rhizomes or roots under there, like those are going to bust up through, I don't know how much, how many inches of wood chips. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that is some of our, between that buttercup and, uh, and uh, morning glory, we're, we're in, and uh, blackberry, we're in weed hell. So thank you, but that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, good luck. Awesome. Thank you. So we have some great questions coming in. Um, how has uh, the demand changed this season with COVID? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of uncertainty for a while there, which was stressful, but was mostly psychological. It wasn't, you know, if anything, the demand has increased by a lot. Um, I think as, you know, I live, you know, the farm is close to population centers here and everybody, I think started thinking very critically about the necessities in life um, as the pandemic really came on and connecting with local farms um, was a was a big priority for a lot of people so um, we sold out of our CSA like two months early um, and I've you know I had to stop answering my phone um, so yeah demand really was was kind of overwhelming um, which created other stresses of you know can we grow enough food or how much how many CSA members should we take? Um, but yeah, I, I feel like if anything, the, the pandemic has increased demand for local food, at least here. Okay. Um, what do you do with the vegetable crop residues, especially stalks and roots from bigger annuals? I'm thinking about like Brussels sprouts stalks. Yeah, brassica stalks probably. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So we used to dig those out painstakingly. <laughs> um, 
And <laughs> that was not fun. And, and also just felt really counterintuitive because they were always, they were always covered in worms and soil life. And there we are like shaking them out and basically like tilling the bed by hand to get these roots out. So now we really try to leave everything in place. So we'll flail mow those beds and leave all the roots right where they are. Um, if there are roots that might grow back, we'll tarp it for a little bit just to make sure they're, they die. And then we'll just plant the next crop right around them. And I try, to, I try to plan the next crop so that the spacing is such that it, it works out, that it's not trying to, you know, it can fit between the, the rows of kale stalks, for instance. Do you rotate your crops, things like, do you, are you careful about following succession plantings behind cabbage, making sure your next crop is compatible or is that a problem? Yeah, I, I, I worry about that to some degree. I definitely don't do, I try not to do back to back the same family um, in a bed just to break like pest and disease cycles. Um, and I'm careful with alliums. I wait four years between plantings of alliums. Um, but otherwise, I don't stress too much. Um, you know, as long as it's not back to back, I, I pretty much follow anything with anything. Um, I'm more concerned with how much stubble is going to be left and what can be planted easily into that. So we're working with the cabbages isn't an issue then, huh? The cabbage family for you? No, what, 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 what kind of issue? Well, it might be because the stuff I've been reading is from Elliot Coleman like 25 years ago or something where he's very careful about all the cabbages and so my I might be a little out of date. No I think I think yeah I, I think I know what you're talking about now where he says you know things tend to not do as well after the brassica family um, like other crops tend to struggle a little bit and I think that's I think that is true I have noticed that but I have my theory is that that's partly related to the mycorrhizal fungus network that I was talking about earlier. Um, that basically those brassicas can starve out the the fungal population. Oh. So then your next crop, if it's fungal, is looking for those connections and can't find them. So that's that's one theory anyway. I, I you know that's not based on much more than intuition, but I, I do think by under sowing the brassicas to parsley and just keeping more diversity in those beds, um, that can kind of offset that lull you might see afterwards. That makes sense. Thank you. I think some folks use that, like the biofumigation effects of mustards and brassicas to their advantage too, if they're fighting like bad fungus situations in their soil, there's a way to use that in a helpful way as well. Totally. Um, any, so yeah, any significant problems with pests? Do you spray? What are you spraying for? Um, there's a question about flea beetles. Um, if you don't have slug damage, you find flea beetles and a problem overwintering in the mulch. How do you manage your pests? Yeah, yeah, so we have had varying degrees of pests. I'd say like a completely pest-free farm. Um, I think I saw some quote somewhere that says like, if, if something's not eating your crops, you're, it's not part of the ecosystem. <laughs> so, so yeah, a completely pest-free farm, um, I don't, I'm not sure if that should exist. Um, so we, I, we do have pests. I'd say flea beetles are a big one in the spring. Um, and we just row cover for that. Um, we have a, a strict no spray policy. Um, I've never sprayed anything, any pesticides, even the organic ones. I just feel like that's um, the, the, the pests are a symptom of a, a lack of life to me, they're, they're a lack of, a symptom of a lack of diversity, a lack of abundance of life. So to, to treat that symptom by killing life just doesn't, it feels kind of backwards um, to me. And I get that sometimes you need to save a crop and you know, that's something, a choice people are gonna make. But in the long run, I think it's actually better to, you know, treat the underlying cause, which is a lack of life in, in the soil or in just the ecosystem as a whole. So you know, planting more diversity, getting, you know, following these, those four principles of soil care, um, I think will tend to address most pest problems in the long run. Um, but we do use row cover for flea beetles um, and put greening on one of our high tunnels to keep out cucumber beetles. 
Um, so we'll use physical exclusion, but we don't do any spraying. I feel like there was a question pretty early on about irrigation. Um, can you talk about water management a little bit on the farm? Yeah, so we have a, a drilled well. Um, it's funny, we were just talking with the apprentices today about this. Um, uh, so we have a drilled well and we use um, overhead wobblers, uh, sort of micro irrigation. Um, we'll use drip tape just on uh, the high tunnel crops that don't want their leaves wet. Um, so the tomatoes and cucumbers. But otherwise, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of overhead micro sprinklers, the wobblers. Um, uh, just you can see them working. You don't have blowouts. Um, and there's just less plastic to deal with. Um, and yeah, it's all from a drilled well um, that, I, that I had dug when, we, when I bought the property. Um, but I will say if, if soils are undisturbed and covered with organic mulches, they need very little irrigation. Um, so that's, that's a real difference between, like the whole conversation around irrigation and drainage kind of shifts um, once you're in a no-till sort of soil fully covered system. Um, so like even this year, um, throughout the drought, we had, I don't know what that was, six or eight weeks of no rain. Um, I didn't irrigate the garlic at all. And it did great because it's under that layer of leaves. Um, and we have loamy sand. Remember that's, that's our parent soil is basically, you know, one step up from beach. Um, so yeah, I think, I think irrigation is a really fascinating topic uh, or just water resilience. Um, Cause as you have more and more organic matter in the soil, it acts as a sponge and just soaks up water and holds it right there in place. And if the soil isn't disturbed, um, it has capillary action um, that will wick up moisture from deep reserves, you know, the water table down below. So it's actually watering plants from below that once you till that up, you break those, those pore spaces, um, it can no longer do that. Or, and you create a hard pan um, below the plow line that won't let water pass through it in either direction. Um, so then you run into drainage problems too, because um, water can't percolate into the soil. So <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think the approaching no-till from a water management perspective is a real compelling reason to consider it. Um, I think it was you that posted a rad picture of your garlic harvest and curing this year, yesterday. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Someone asks, um, tips on curing garlic. Yeah, sure. I'm excited to be trying a new system. I went to like a, a workshop, I think it was at Farmer to Farmer last fall. Um, uh, I think uh, I think it was a Cornell researcher did a got a Sarah Grant to study different garlic curing methods and <clears throat> basically came up with um, they were kind of pushing this method of um, almost like turn your greenhouse into a solar dehydrator um, and dry down the garlic really quickly um, and that will prevent all sorts of uh, you know, potential fungal issues. Um, because up until this year, we've always just hung the garlic in the barn in bundles with the greens on and been kind of at the mercy of the weather. You know, if it's humid and rainy for a week, the garlic gets surface mold on it, which is just cosmetic, but it makes it a little harder to sell. Um, and then we're also just dealing with all these greens, you know, hundreds of extra pounds of green material that we have to bundle up and tie up in the barn, climbing up a ladder. So, so yeah, I was just kind of taken with this idea of pre-topping, putting it in the greenhouse, and then letting the greenhouse get as hot as 110 degrees. Like don't, don't vent or cool the greenhouse until it hits 110 and have fans going in there. And um, I even rented a dehumidifier um, so that, you know, when the sides are down, it's, it's sucking moisture out of the air. Um, and yeah, that we harvested garlic about, I guess it was a week ago or six days ago. And uh, it's pretty much cured by now um, in there. Um, and hopefully that will leave us with like those nice white heads of garlic instead of the ones speckled with, with blue mold that, you know, again, it's just cosmetic. It doesn't affect the, the flavor or the longevity, but it, it makes it a little unsightly. Um, do, so you tell, 
do you sell seed garlic or does it all go to um, your CSA and wholesale account? It's all culinary, yeah, for CSA and the natural food stores and farmer's market. Um, we have the garlic bloat nematode um, that first showed up, I think, like eight years ago. Uh, came in on contaminated seed, I guess, must have. Um, and we've been managing that ever since, but at, at this, you know, I think forever it won't be ethical for us to sell seed garlic. Uh, do you make your own weed seed free compost? If not, where are you sourcing your compost? Yeah, great question. So we make our own compost, but it's not uh, it's not weed free and it's not sifted because we just don't have that machinery. I just have a, a small tractor. Um, so I turn the compost sort of when I feel like it kind of thing. Um, and so yeah, it ends up chunky and with some weed seeds. So we'll use that in places, um, but uh, on on beds that are getting direct seeded, I'll buy in compost um, from, there's a local farm here, Benson Farm, that makes um, pretty good compost. Um, there's a couple other sources, but this year in the pandemic, all of a sudden every, every home gardener um, started buying up all the compost. So there was a real shortage. It was, there was a lot of drama in the in the in the main compost scene <laughs> everyone's scrambling for compost so um luckily at this point my nutrient load is such that i actually am not applying compost anymore um because that would be overloading nutrients um especially phosphorus but also some of the micronutrients um because i've just applied so much compost over the years <clears throat> so now i use bark mulch as my compost as my top dress on the beds. So that sort of ties in with our nitrogen tie up carbon conversation from earlier. Um, you know, bark mulch is pretty heavy on the carbon, but I'm just using it on the surface and hopefully not much of it is getting mixed in. So it's, uh, yeah, can plant, sorry about that, can plant, uh, can plant right into it, can even direct seed right into it. Um, and it's a low nutrient mulch as opposed to compost, which is a high nutrient mulch. Um, someone was saying um, in the video you drilled into the ground a hole for a potato seed. Do you need to hill at all, hilling potatoes? Mm. Yeah, I, I'll say right off the bat, I'm not an expert at potato growing. Um, but yeah, we, we, um, we used a, a rock bar and just, you know, it's a very heavy steel bar and we just dropped that to make a, a nice like six to eight inch deep hole. Um, and then we poked the potato seed all the way to the bottom of that. So it's, it's deep enough and our soil is friable enough that it, it's already popping up through there fine. But I, I think it's deep enough, we won't need to hill it. Um, if anything, we might add some more mulch. We could add some leaf mulch around it as it grows if we did want to hill it. But I, realistically, we probably won't. Um, and I did just drop the link to the YouTube video um, in the chat. So Daniel and our Southern Maine coordinator for Mafka, Lucy, went around Frith Farm and filmed a rad hour long video. It's kind of like a farm tour. So if you want to see that and see more pictures of the farm, you can see it there. Um, when do you use a broad fork? Yeah, only when needed. So generally our beds are, you know, pretty good tilth just from the biological action of, of soil organisms. But um, if we go to transplant and it's hard to get our hands in, that's when we'll get out the broad fork and broad fork the whole bed. Um, so yeah, kind of as needed. I think uh, if the soils were more clay and we were sort of just building up the soil health, maybe we'd use it before every crop. Awesome. So we have um, time for about one more question. If someone wants to, um, unmute themselves and ask a question and encourage that. Hi, this is Bruce. Uh, I have a question about whether you use any of uh, seaweed or uh, direct sea products uh, for either fertilizing or, or uh, other uses. Sure, yeah, I have. Um, when, I, when I do that one time tillage to establish um, beds, I mix in a lot at that point because that's the the one and only opportunity to actually mechanically mix in amendments. So at that point, I do add in, um, you know, seaweed, uh, 
you know, according to a soil test, but I'll add in micronutrients, I'll add in lime to, to get the pH right. Um, I'll add in compost as well and, and, you know, till all of that in as I till that one time. Um, and then that's kind of like the jump starts the whole biological engine, if you will. And, and from then on, I haven't added a whole lot um, besides just mulches and, and cover crops. Um, and, and a little bit of fertilizer, you know, according to a soil, soil test. Um, and yeah, I guess sometimes in that fertilizer mix, there might be uh, kelp meal or, or seaweed fines. Um, but I, I, yeah, I don't do any foliars yet. I might start toying with that. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Daniel, do you have any like last things that we didn't touch on that you think would be important for folks to know or you want to highlight? Um, no, I think uh, <laughs> I, I wish we could do all this in person, I guess. So yeah. That's that sentiment. Uh, <laughs> talking about, you know, soil life and health and diversity and, you know, connections between organisms. It's, it's sort of ironic to be doing this all electronically. Via the, yes. <laughs> this computer screen but the device that's made out of extracted minerals yeah 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 uh, but no, i'm glad we're able to do it at all well thank you so much um for all of your knowledge that you continue to share with the community um i encourage people to check out the video thank you all for coming out tonight um at this point um we're gonna close our event um i encourage you all to as our offices remain closed due to COVID, I encourage everyone to check out the MAFCA website and our event listing. Um, we do have lots of workshops that happen every week. Um, every Wednesday, there's something that's part of this farm training project series. Um, all of those you do have to register for ahead of time because some do cap out if it's a more interactive conversation space. But thank you all for coming out and um, have a great rest of the growing season. Yes, thank you all. That was great.